Hello there, good afternoon and welcome to the Weather Studio Live. It's 1pm, it's January the 8th of January. That's correct. Yes, yeah. that's right. So Jenny, good, you yeah, said it oh, twice. No, I know, I did. It's the it's 2019. Yes, it's the first Weather Studio Live. It's going so well this morning already, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Uh, yes. We're talking about lots of things today. We're so pleased to be back, aren't we? We are. We are. I've got a bit of a cough. Hopefully, it won't disturb things too much. I'm not that infectious, no. Claire. Don't worry. Uh, I'm Adam McGiven, by the way. I work here at the Met Office. We are in the Met Office HQ, mm -hmm. reporting live. For your pleasure. So what's coming up today? Well, it's a big, big show today. We're talking about everything to do with snow and ice, mostly about Europe, but will that cold air be coming our way? Will there be snow in our forecast over the next few weeks or snow or so? So across much of Europe, we've seen, well, headline news really, a lot of snow covering much of central and southeastern parts of that region. We'll be taking a jaunt around that part of the world and talking about what's coming up next. Not only that, yes, we will revisit the sudden stratospheric warming. Last year, do you remember we had Dr. Jeff Knight on the programme? He was talking about an imminent event. Well, it did happen on the 22nd of December and that warming could actually have impacts on the UK's weather over the next few months. We'll could. be talking about that as well. Not only, obviously, up there, something happening, but down here as well. What's happening? What is going to happen? We'll be answering those questions. That's right. And uh, if you have any questions, please send them in. We'll try our best to get round to them. I know many of the questions will be, is it going to snow? Let's clear that one up straight away, because over the next seven to ten days, when we have a reliable, uh, specific weather forecast for different parts of the UK, for different days, we can say that, well, snow is looking very unlikely. So most people, wherever you are, unless you're on top of a Scottish mountain, snow is unlikely. It's actually going to turn a little bit milder into the weekend. However, into the final third of January and February, what we can say is that there is an increased risk that we'll have colder weather. We can't give specific forecasts of snow on specific days in specific places. So for the next seven to ten days, no snow. But after that, we'll be looking at today why we can say that there is an increased chance of snow for the second half of winter. We'll be looking at the mechanisms behind that with Dr. Jeff Knight. Of course, this is a discussion. This is 20 minutes. So you'll be sending in your questions. We'll be answering them for very quick forecasts. You can go onto the Met Office app. You can head over to the Met Office social media channels. So there are all sorts of uh, different formats that we do from the very, very brief to the much longer discussion formats that we have here. So if you're after a very quick forecast, there are plenty of other places to get that. We'll be having a chat about the nuts and bolts behind the weather forecast here today. Now, much of Europe has been in the grip of uh, bitterly cold air and a lot of snow in the forecast over the last few days. I don't know whether you've read any of the headlines across Europe or whether you have actually been to the Alps skiing or further afield to Greece. But yes, snow has been a real problem there. Not only a problem, some people are celebrating the fact that they've seen a lot of snow. It's been a bumper season so far for the Alpine resorts. In fact, we've got some lovely images here. This is from Hotel Taloy in Berseberg. Elevation around 900 metres. It's a, a ski resort on the western side of the Alps in Austria. And look at this. Yes, a huge amount of snow here. Um, we're talking probably snow depth of, would you say, a metre and a half there? It just makes me jealous. It really is. Beautiful scenes. And in fact, some resorts across Switzerland, Germany and Austria are boasting between three and four metres of snow. And a mat still at the top there with over four Blimey. metres of snow. So yes, there's been a huge amount, not so much at the Pyrenees, but coupled with that, we have seen a lot of strong winds as well, particularly towards the, the west of the Alps. And French Alps not seeing as much snow as they'd like to, but there, are, there is some on the way. But it's the wind which has caused a lot of problems over the last few days across the Alps. Now, these are images from Austria, and in Austria in particular, the winds have caused fears of perhaps an avalanche um, across the Tyrol region of, of the country. And St. Johann had a forced evacuation two days ago because of fears of an avalanche. Not only that, chaos, travel chaos across much of Germany, some parts of Switzerland. 120 flights were cancelled in Munich. Others were just postponed for a few hours, but 
thousands of people have been affected by that. Roads have been closed, uh, trains have been rerouted, and picture postcard mm. images like this of Places Greece. that you normally associate mm. with hot weather. Well, it masks a lot of dangers because the blizzards across that have actually claimed three lives already in Greece. So what's been going on, Aidan? Well, one of the key things we've been looking at over the last few days is how amplified the jet stream has been. As you can see here, it really is pushing up towards Iceland, down towards the UK. We are pretty much in the firing line for, for that sort of, sort of northerly flow from the jet stream. High pressure towards the west there. And as you can see, this the jet stream is really delineates the colder air towards the north and northeast and, and the milder conditions sandwiched in between. And the blocking high has meant where we've seen low pressure either side of it, where you've seen bad weather, it just has been relentless and it's continued. Hence the reason why we've seen strong winds and blizzards, icy conditions and really, really cold air. So not only down towards Greece, Albania, but then this extensive weather front here, which is pushed from the north down towards the south, hitting the cold air. And so we've seen snow across many areas. Now, on my weather app, um, the Met Office weather app, I was looking at a place in Russia called Yakust. And the temperature, yes, Siberia, the temperature over the next 24 hours, well, what's the max? Ooh, below minus 30, minus right? Minus 45. Wow. Wow. Can't even imagine that. Yeah, so that's right over there. And so you can yeah. imagine that's the really, really cold air, not as cold further south, but the forecast for temperatures across the Alpine resorts over the next 24 hours is minus 21 degrees Celsius. So if you are heading off skiing there, yes, a bumper crop of snow, but also it is bitter bitterly cold. So what's the forecast for the next a few days? Well, the interesting thing is the jet stream pretty much stays in the same place. Yes, this high sort of regresses back towards the west there, but we are expecting a cut of low across Albania as well as some parts of Greece and what that means, more snow in the forecast for this region um, and it's not looking good at all. More snow also for the Alps. Will this cold air impact the UK over the next few days, over the next few weeks? Well, currently, it doesn't look like it's going to, does it? Not in the immediate future, no. I mean, when we talk about the cold weather that we had last year, that came from Siberia. You quoted those very cold temperatures, cold air, didn't you? And, and that came on an easterly. Mm. You can see there we've got high pressure over the next week or so to the southwest of the UK, driving weather systems in from the Atlantic. Let's put on the jet stream. Uh, because, of course, the jet stream is the key driver with these things. When, when the jet stream is strong, it brings these things in from the Atlantic. It's a little bit amplified over the next few days, but it is still bringing relatively mild air mm. to the UK. Now, we'll be chatting with our next guest, Dr. Jeff Knight, about uh, what influences the jet stream. What did you get up to on New Year's Eve, first of all, Claire? Was I it a wild party? Mm, was it... No, no, you know me. No, I went, to, went to the cinema. Home, tucked by up. Ten. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A few fireworks that I was listening to, you know, curtains closed. I was fast asleep by mm. 11 as well. I we know have a lot so much fun in this department, don't we? <laughs> we work hard, play, yeah, yeah. play less hard, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, I know a lot of people watching fireworks. Our next guest, he wasn't watching fireworks. He was watching on New Year's Eve something much more explosive unfold in the polar stratosphere, mm -hmm. something called sudden stratospheric warming. Now, before we bring on Jeff, you might remember him from a few weeks ago. He appeared and he talked us through what sudden stratospheric warming is, what the stratospheric polar vortex is. And I just wanted to do a brief recap for those who uh, were here and also for those who weren't able to watch that. Now, when we talk about the stratosphere, first of all, we live in an area, a, a, a slice of atmosphere called the troposphere. And that typically goes up to around 10 kilometers. When you go up in an aeroplane, you approach the top of the troposphere. The jet stream lies towards the trop top of the troposphere. Most of our weather happens below that. Now, above the troposphere, that's where you get the stratosphere, around 10 to 50 kilometers high in the sky. And as Jeff was explaining a few weeks ago, you find the ozone layer in the stratosphere. Now, the ozone layer absorbs UV, keeping us from frying down below, but it also it warms up in the summer because it's absorbing all that UV from the sun. However, when the northern hemisphere tilts away from the sun in the winter, then the polar stratosphere temperatures plummet. And often through the months of autumn into early winter, you'll see the temperatures at around 30 kilometers above the North Pole get to around minus 70, maybe approaching minus 80 Celsius. 
So very cold air in the stratosphere, 30 kilometers above the North Pole. This is a typical pattern. It cools down there around middle winter and then it, it starts to warm up again through the spring and into the summer. That's a typical pattern. However, some years it can become mm. disturbed. This, so is the, this is what we call the stratospheric polar vortex, a pool of very cold air in the stratosphere, 30 kilometers above the North Pole. OK, so this cold air is locked in by these really strong winds. And this model is pretty much business as usual. Most winters we see this, do we? That's right. So around this stratospheric polar vortex, you have a perimeter of strong winds like a jet stream, 30 kilometers high above our very own jet stream. Fast flowing air keeps it locked in. But sometimes disturbances many miles away in other parts of the world can send ripples of energy. Those ripples of energy can crash into this and split it apart. Now, uh, this is a simplified uh, picture here showing the split occurring. And when the split occurs in its wake above the North Pole in the stratosphere, you get the air descending, warming up rapidly. And instead of low pressure, instead of a polar vortex, you get high pressure. And as a result, the winds start to go in the opposite direction. And that is sudden stratospheric warming. So why is that important for our weather? Well, if the winds in a normal situation are going in this sort of direction, west to east, 30 kilometers above the North Pole, then it enhances our very own jet stream. It helps to strengthen it. But when the air warms above the North Pole, the winds can reverse at that height in the stratosphere, and that can send impacts all the way down gradually through the other layers, lower down in the atmosphere, and it can help to push against the jet stream and weaken it somewhat. It's not the only thing that strengthens and weakens our jet stream, but it is a big player. So what you can see after a sudden stratospheric warming is colder weather. So this happened last year, and then we talked about a blast of cold air coming in from the northeast on the 22nd of December last year, as in this winter, it was announced again. The SSW, as we call it, began with sudden warming in the stratosphere and now we're looking to see whether there will be impacts across Europe and the UK over not only the next few weeks but also the next few months. For the rest of winter right, yeah. it could have impacts. Mm -hmm. the, here's the warming, it's really quite dramatic. Significant. It's 60 degrees That's or more. That's crazy really over if you think about it. Over yeah. 60 degrees, yeah. you know, if that yeah. happened at surface level we would be pretty shocked. We'd we? know about it, yes. That's right. And uh, the man who predicted this at the end of last year and then watched it unfold. Dr. Jeff Knight, please welcome to the show, Jeff. Welcome again. Uh, returning Thank to you, popular Ian. demand. Thank you. uh, now, Claire, if, you, if you don't mind uh, heading out and, and checking to see if there's any questions and then you can come back and... and we'll the key thing is, please send your questions and comments because we can direct those to Jeff afterwards and I'll come in and we can have another conversation. So I'll leave you chaps to it. Okay. So, Jeff, Around the turn of the year, um, we saw this dramatic warming above the North Pole. As you suggested would happen when you last appeared on the Weather Studio Live, what, what went through your mind when you saw this happen? Well, it's been a case of it really unfolding ever since the, um, the beginning of December. We've been watching the likelihood of, of this event actually increase all the time until we were pretty much uh, uh, definite that it was going to happen um, in, in, say, a week before Christmas. Um, so, you know, the, you sort of see that this temperature increase beginning sort of in late December. Uh, the key date for us in terms of the uh, dynamics is um, the 2nd of January. That was the, uh, when the, um, the SSW, uh, in technical terms, was reckoned to have happened. Right. So all the things that we talk about in terms of the time scales um, are relative to that date. Let's look at that in a second. This is a slightly different way of looking at it. We're looking directly down on the North Pole here. There's the North Pole, there's the UK. Talk us through this, Jeff. What, what kind of height in the atmosphere is this? So this is a, a slice at 30 kilometers up, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, what it shows is contour lines which show the direction of the flow of the air and the colors of the temperature. So this is like in a typical case. So mm -hmm. this is from uh, like an autumn case or late autumn, early winter case. And the contours show that the air is flowing around in this counterclockwise direction, this sort of westerly wind, as you showed on your previous 
graphic. So this is the same sort of direction that we typically see the jet stream flow in. So you've got 30 kilometer wind circulation. Mm -hmm at the same direction as the 10 kilometer jet stream they're going at the same in the same direction they're going in tandem one enhances the other right yes that's that's right so that's there's, the there's a coherency case. between the two things now you mentioned the 2nd of january so we look at the same view here we're skipping forward to the 2nd of january mm. it looks quite different doesn't it so this is in the midst of the ssw event and so what you can see is, quite noticeably, the, the polar vortex has been pushed off the pole um, and is uh, now displaced here. Um, instead of that, it's getting replaced by the, the opposite sense of circulation. So you've got, um, uh, instead of uh, the winds circulating around the pole uh, in, in this direction from west to east, they're going in the opposite direction from east to west. So um, that's where we were uh, last week. And so I think you've got another picture which And shows then moving it forward further to the next week or so. Yeah. And so this is really kind of the, the end point. This is mm. the, the final um, evolution of the SSW, if you like. And here now we have the anticyclonic conditions dominating, uh, the high pressure conditions dominating over the, the pole, um, quite the opposite or exactly the opposite to what we would normally see. Um, and the polar vortex has been split in, into parts here and has weakened dramatically. Now the way I, I've tried to get my head around this, because it's quite an abstract concept, I like uh, going out on my bike, cycling, okay? And if I know that I'm going to get a tailwind, then I think, great, that's going to give me lots of energy. It's going to push me along, right? Mm -hmm. If I know I'm going to get a headwind, then, well, I'm going to struggle. It's going to sap my energy. I'm not going to achieve a, as fast a time. However, there are other things that make me cycle fast or slow. Mm -hmm like what I've eaten for breakfast, <laughs> how much sleep I've had, right? Yeah. So in the same way, I guess, the jet stream has its very own headwind and tailwind, and that is the wind way above it in the stratosphere. It's and so through a typical winter, mm -hmm. you'd have a tailwind helping to keep it strong, keep it going, keep those low pressure systems heading towards the UK. Exactly. But what we've got now is that the jet stream has a tailwind, a headwind, right? So it's, That's right, yeah. it's working against So it's it. fighting against um, uh, this effect from above. But it's not the only thing. You know, we, we, we also think about what the jet streams have for breakfast or how much sleep it's had, or, exactly. or in other words, other parts of the atmosphere that will work for or against the jet stream. So it's not the only thing, but it is really important. And it's likely to continue to have an impact, isn't it? That's right. So. What we um, can see here in this picture uh, is uh, a projection from our long-range forecast system. And the colours on it correspond to the strength of the polar vortex. So we have time going along here. So this is February, March, April. Mm -hmm. And then this is height above the surface of the Earth. Okay. And um, what we can see is that this is the SSW here, these blue colours. So that's um, where the wind has switched around. Indeed. Blue represents exactly. where the wind has gone in the opposite direction. That's right. And then um, what we can see is that when we look at the, the lower part of the stratosphere down here, which is closest to where our weather is, then it stays disturbed for a very long time. So right up into, uh, into February or March. So essentially for the rest of the winter. And that pattern of disturbance is very typical of what we see for SSW events. Because you're a student of SSW events, aren't you? You've looked back through the record books over 50 years or so. How many SSWs have you studied over the last half a century? Well, we've got... I haven't personally um, studied them over half a century. I'm not quite that old. But um, we've got records that go back over that period, and you can look back and, and analyse what went on in the past. And typically, these SSW events happen at a rate of about one every two years. Okay. So there's about 25 or so They're not on that record. uncommon. And each one, I guess, the impacts are different because the weather's so chaotic and complicated and there are many other influences. Well, that's right. You know, so um, the SSWs tend to happen in a, in a fairly standard way and they have a, a fairly standard impact on the surface. but. They're not the only impact that's happening on the surface. Right. A bit like your, your bicycle example, then you know, you've got the headwind or the, the tailwind, but then there's all the other stuff as well that determines how fast you're going to go. You can have that analogy if you want, <laughs> if you want to use that for your own purposes. <laughs> now, it's 
like I mentioned, complicated. Now, in a typical winter, you might have uh, the stratospheric polar vortex mm -hmm. remaining intact. And we were talking yesterday about an instance where we had really cold weather, but we had this strong polar vortex. So that's right. I mean, we're looking at past SSW to talk about the, the record books. And uh, a key example is, um, say, from 1987. So in January 1987, we had a, a, a very, very cold uh, um, uh, easterly flow that came across the UK. It was probably the coldest week of the 20th century. Wow. Um, and that happened, I think, about two or three weeks before a, a sun stratospheric warming. So it's not always um, the case that you have to have one of these events to get cold and it's not always the case that if you have one of these events you know it will be cold. Yes so we have had an, an, an event take place in the stratosphere it doesn't guarantee cold weather but there are signs aren't there in the second half of winter if we move it on one then this is what some of the computer models are now suggesting. That's right. This is a period uh, around the, the final third of January. Mm -hmm. what, what are we seeing here Jeff? So this is what the, the computer models are, are sort of projecting um, for that period and, and what I'm showing here is the difference in um, surface pressure conditions from normal from average okay and so this highlights the the impact that the SSW is having. So we see up here across the high latitudes this band of higher than usual pressure mm. and there's a tendency for in the in the bands to the uh, south of that for there to be lower than average pressure. So um, what this is is a pattern called the negative uh, arctic oscillation that's what we call it as climatologists and what it means is that the usual westerly flow that um, follows uh, the, the jet stream uh, around this kind of latitude is, is slowed down. Mm. It's not as strong as it, as it normally is. And you're more of a risk of seeing northerlies, easterlies, northeasterlies, that exactly. sort of thing. But it's yes. not guaranteed. Because uh, looking back to last year, we had a sudden stress threat warming in February. And then everyone will remember the very cold weather that we had in March. But it only lasted a few days, didn't it? And then we had a mild interlude around the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. And then it got cold again around the middle of March. So this, this is exactly how, how um, we should think about these things. Because um, what we're seeing is, is the, the SSW introduces like a change of environment. And that change of environment lasts for a long period of time. But that doesn't mean to say that we're going to get continuous cold weather during that period. Um, we might, for example, see something like last year where you had some episodes. Mm. Um, and that is because this effect is a physical effect that's driven by the, the stratosphere that is there all the time uh, once we've had these SSWs. That is going to happen. Mm. Mm. But in these models, we have other effects like um, the stuff that comes from the uh, synoptic weather variability. Where the lows are, where the, where lows the highs, highs are, are, the exact where the details. Weather fronts are. I mean, knowing yeah. as a weather forecaster, mm. you can't really pin those down until a couple of days before often, well, that, can that's, you? that's right. So this is why, you know, in, in models we can't predict accurately mm. beyond five, six, ten days. And um, so there's that kind of, that um, tropospheric weather component, which is relatively unpredictable. And then there's this stratospheric component on the top, which is very predictable. Yeah. So we're trying to combine something that's unpredictable with something that's predictable. And so in the end, we get some, some kind of idea that, OK, the probability of getting a particular outcome is shifted, but it's, it's not guaranteed. So just to very quickly summarise, if I, if, I, if I understand you correctly, the jet stream now has a headwind for the rest of winter that headwind is 20 kilometers above the jet stream but it will help to hinder that jet stream rather than help it along and that means that for the second half of winter well there's a higher likelihood of episodes of cold weather that's right but yes. not guaranteed because you can't guarantee these things in such a complicated environment. Let's bring Claire exactly. back in. I'm sure there's been loads of questions. Oh yes, there really has. And in fact, <laughs> some really interesting questions as well. Um, one in particular, which I know we saw in the headline news last week, people were talking about something called the triple polar vortex. Okay. And uh, BJN Golf says, because the uh, polar vortex is split into three this time rather than two, does it have an effect on blocking systems across Europe and the UK? 
Well, all I can really sort of say on that is that the scientific evidence is, is pretty weak, actually, on, on that point. Um, I think, as I was trying to allude to uh, earlier, the main point is that we've gone through a, a huge transition from this kind of hemispheric, westerly type circulation mm -hmm. to something you know, that isn't that. And I think that's the main point. The, the exact details of where the, 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 the bits afterwards fall, I don't think is necessarily as important. No, that's a, that's a fair point. Mike Slaughter says, does the SSW happen this time of year each year, but what or was 2018 really unusual? Um, so it doesn't happen every, every time be, this, this year. Some years we don't get one at all, and other years we get two. So um, it's very variable. Um, we tend to get more events in January uh, and February than in December, um, but uh, essentially it just depends. That's kind of one of the, the, the good things um, about having sort of variability from year to year is that sometimes these happen, sometimes they don't. And another question very similar actually, Momo 666 says, is the SSW as major as last year and will we get those record lows we did around sort of the 28th of Feb, 1st of March? Well, um, I think it's a, a, as big an event as last year, but um, I don't think that the timings will, will be quite the same. Clearly, you know, this is a much earlier event. We're looking at, at um, uh, a key date uh, is 2nd of January, um, whereas uh, last year we had a, um, an SSW on the, I think it was the 12th of February. So everything is kind of earlier. I mean, in a way, that kind of means that the, the window of opportunity is, is actually longer. Um, whether we will get something as, as uh, sharp and intense as, as the cold that we got um, uh, at the end of February is also, you know, who knows? I mean, that was a particularly lovely example that we saw. It was textbook, really, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Um, often these things tend to be a bit more messy. A final question from Chris Little on Facebook. Thanks very much for your question, Chris. And it's an interesting one. Is there a correlation between the SSW and the coldest winters historically across the UK? Um, so I think that's kind of difficult to answer in many ways because a lot of the coldest winters happened before we knew anything about SSWs. So they were only really discovered in, in the 1950s, um, so in the late 1940s, 1950s. And of course, you know, when we look back at our history books, we can see, see some, some you know, very, very cold, cold winters you know, in, in, in the 1700s and, and that. So I, I don't know if it's easy to be able to, to make that correct. We need another 50 years, don't we, really? We do. Yeah. We, that would be lovely. Mm, if you could find you know, historical records somewhere down the back of the sofa for me, that would be terrific. But you must imagine the day the scientists noticed, oh my goodness, look what's happened in the stratosphere. You'd, look, you'd double take, wouldn't you? Absolutely, and then just yeah, measure yeah. again. Because mm. it's so significant, 60 degrees hike. It, it's something you'd never really see at mm. ground level. And, you know, nowadays, of course, we have a huge amount of data available to us from satellites and, and from our global observing system. But in those days, the guys were just... Look, any, the only thing that went up that height was, um, was uh, balloons. Yeah. So you had individual balloon ascents that people were looking at and, and sort of noticing, noting down the temperatures. And so it really was, a, you know, a very... Um, a case of careful bookkeeping in those days. Mm. Well, Jeff, that's Fantastic. really interesting. Really, we could talk all day about this, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've, we've run out of time. And thank you for returning and You're uh, talking us through it this time. Yeah, we'll mm. see what happens next. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come back again in a few <laughs> weeks. I mean, a lot of questions have been about snow, and obviously, you mm. know, it's still a trend for turning a lot colder, but it's watched mm. this space, really, isn't it? Exactly. Snow's so difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, it, oftentimes a particular snow event is only forecastable maybe a couple of days ahead or and something. all it takes is a d degree yeah. or so drop in temperature yeah. the general environment any colder mm. we can possibly say something about but you know, snow is is quite hard yeah, that's why you like your job and not ours <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly yeah. Yeah. thank you Jeff. Jeff. okay Cheers. you're welcome uh, yeah lots of uh, lots of interesting comments and questions about that great to have Jeff back now just a quick look before we finish at the weather over the next few days. Uh, we've not talked about it much because it it's is messy, relatively no. quiet. Mm -hmm. We've got still the jet stream riding high over the UK. We've got high pressure just slowly over the rest of the week slipping away. Mm -hmm. And that will allow a bit more of an influence from the Atlantic. And so the main theme, isn't it, that we uh, see through Thursday, Friday, 
is a return to cloudier skies again because it's great to have a couple of sunny days after such a dull period of weather over uh, the, the Christmas holidays. I think the good news is if you live across the eastern strip of the country, you're going to lose that really biting cold wind mm. as we head into the latter part of the working week. But then the wind returns into the weekend. Things become a little bit more mobile, as you can see here, a cold front sinking its way southwards. And behind that, maybe we will see some clearer skies, but quite a gradient there. So uh, the wind will pick up again, leading into a quite an unsettled part to what well, start to next week. Yeah. So the trend next week is for uh, the high pressure to slip ever so slightly away and we'll have more of an Atlantic influence. Now, none of this contradicts our conversation with Jeff, of course, because we were talking about trends towards the final third of January. And we'll be looking at the forecast through the weekend and into next week in much more detail in the 10 day trend tomorrow, which, of course, you can uh, take a look at on our YouTube channel and our Facebook mm. page. Uh, but for now, I think that's all we have for you. So uh, let's wrap it up. And thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions. We'll see you again next week.